The following story has been brought to you by StoriesToInspire.org. Back in 1835, there was an incident that took place in Slavita, part of Russia. It became known as the Slavita Libel. The story goes that there were two brothers. One's name was Shmuel, one name was Pinchas. Their last name was also Shapiro, the same name as the person of my last story, but no relation. These two Shapiro brothers ran a very successful Jewish publishing house that they inherited from their father called the Slavita Press. This publishing house churned out prayer books and chumashim and volumes of the Talmud and other sacred writings. It was an extremely high-quality printing press and binding company that they ran. It was the pride of the Jewish community. It was the main business of the city. And therefore, it also brought upon the anger of the anti-Semitic elements within that community, aided that business, because it's what gave Jews Parnassa. And the church at that time was quite anti-Semitic in this town. They too hated the Shapiro Press, the Slavita Press. One day a terrible tragedy struck when the Slavita Press's bookbinder, an individual who suffered from severe depression, went into the synagogue one day, and he committed suicide. If this painful incident wasn't horrific enough, the anti-Semitic priest from the neighboring city, who had long had it in for the Shapiro brothers, always looking for a way to initiate a libel, claimed that the brothers had the bookbinder killed. And they didn't have a hard enough time finding co-conspirators to come and back up this claim that they know that there was a plot by the owners of this business because of some dispute financially to have their bookbinder killed and claim that he killed himself. The brothers were immediately arrested on the trumped-up charges. They were thrown into prison in Kiev, where they were subjected to daily torturous interrogations, trying to force them to admit to the sin, to the crime. But for all the abuse that was put upon them, they refused to confess. They would not confess to something they did not do. No matter what, beat us, kill us, you're not getting a confession out of us. This went on for weeks, this went on for months. Morning, afternoon, and night, they completely and unequivocally claimed their innocence. While they were imprisoned for this period of months, they managed to arrange for a tiny, small, safer Torah to be brought to them very small Torah scroll. And every day they opened this little Torah, these two brothers, they recited the words from this Torah together, they studied from this this Torah, and they, they got strength from the fact that they were imprisoned together with this tiny Torah. The summer of 1841, it's now six years after their arrest. Six years they're in this prison. Six years they're being interrogated. Six years they're being pressured and tortured to admit six years they're holding to their innocence. There's a trial. There's no confession, nor is there any evidence of any kind. But there's a kangaroo court, and the brothers are now given by by the judge the final choice. This is what it comes down to. Either you admit guilt for the murder of the bookbinder, or your punishment will be to run the gauntlet. What's the running of the gauntlet? The running of the gauntlet was two rows of 250 Russian soldiers on each side, each with whips. And the brothers would be tied up, and they would have to run the gauntlet back and forth and back and forth. Each soldier they would pass would whip them. The judge says, unless you admit, you will run the gauntlet either six times or death will happen sooner. Those are your options. Admit and you'll be treated fairly, (laughs) run the gauntlet and die, or run the gauntlet six times and survive in whatever physical shape you will find yourself in after running this gauntlet. The brothers made it clear that no matter what promises of leniency or freedom were dangled in front of them, they will never have a false admission come off their lips, and so they're prepared to run the gauntlet. The brothers' hands were tied around these long rifles affixed to their bodies, And then they had a soldier pulling each brother across the line. And as they passed each soldier, each soldier would take their whip out 
and whip each brother. The Shapiro brothers passed through the gauntlet one time, a second time, a third time. They're surviving. During their last time, the yarmulke that was on the head of Pinchas Shapiro fell off while he's in the gauntlet. Pinchas Shapiro refused to move. And he's getting whipped and whipped and whipped. He can see survival at the very end. He won't move without the yarmulke. I've worn that yarmulke every day in prison for six years. I'm not about to let it be off my head right now. Finally, one of the Russian officers was so moved and so inspired by the bravery and the courage of this man, he picks up the yarmulke, puts it on top of Pinchas' head, and pushes him along. When this ordeal was over, many of the soldiers, cold and heartless though they may have been, bowed their heads in awe and possibly in shame to these two brothers. They had never seen such courage, such strength, and such resilience, and perhaps such holiness. Pinchas and Shmuel Shapiro were taken to the Kiev hospital, and they were nursed back to their health. When they were well enough, they were sent to Siberia, until Tsar Alexander II freed them 17 years later, on June 1, 1856. There's a very interesting epilogue to this story. That little Torah scroll that I told you about that they had in their prison cell belonging to the Shapiro brothers, which kept their spirits and their resolve going through the years of their imprisonment, was carefully guarded and protected for generations thereafter. And it was smuggled out of Russia, and in 1954 it was given as a gift to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. If you've ever seen a picture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe holding a small little white Torah, that is the Shapiro Torah. If you've ever seen the Rebbe dance on Simchas Torah holding a small Torah, that is the Torah he would dance with. If you've ever seen the Rebbe called up to a tiny Torah, that was the Torah that he was called up to. He treated that Torah with the respect that it deserved because it was held by two people that showed such mesiras nefesh, such self-sacrifice, such giving over themselves to God, to Torah, to Judaism. And it served as such an inspiration to them that the Rebbe wanted to connect himself to their lives, to connecting themselves to their Torah. You know, one of the greatest sages of of all was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva also lost his life by the hands of the Romans, one of the ten martyrs arrested by the Romans for his crime of teaching Torah. And the Talmud describes how in the final moments of his life, as his skin was being raked off his body, Rabbi Akiva cries out, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. His students are watching in horror. And the students say to Rabbi Akiva, Even now? Even now when this is happening to you, you can pray the Shema? Even now? So Rabbi Akiva answers his students in the final words he says in his life. He says, even now, of course now. All my life that I said these words of the Shema, and I said, I wondered if I would have the strength, if it ever came to be that I would have the strength, if I was in need to give my life for God, would I have it? And now I see in this last moment of life, indeed, that I had that strength. Of course now I say the Shema. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.